to see you tonight. Thank you for coming and being with us to worship tonight. Those that may be watching by Facebook or YouTube, we thank you for, for joining us tonight for worship. I want to uh, begin with prayer. Would you bow with us, please, as we begin? Father, I just want to say thank you, Lord, that, uh, God, you let us come back tonight because you said so. Just like the song said, because you said so, we're here. Father, I just want to say thank you that, God, uh, that we can still on Sunday nights and other nights come and worship you as we choose in the world that we live in today. Father, I thank you for every blessing of life that you give us. The journey of life, Lord, and we preach about it a lot, is up hills and down hills and good days and bad days, but that's the journey. Every person in your Bible had that journey to take. It can't all be good and it won't all be bad. But God, the thing about it is I preach this morning, you'll be with us no matter whether we're up or whether we're down. No matter whether we are, are, are losing our faith, God, you will help us restore that back. And so, God, I thank you as the Bible says, for being a very present help in time of need, God. That's our God. And so, Lord, I thank you, Lord, for being our God today. And I pray tonight, as we come to worship and to teach God, that the Holy Spirit of God uh, may come and fill this preacher, fill this place, fill these people. God, we thank you for the old rugged cross. God, we thank you that God, heaven is available because of that cross. And because of that resurrection, you said, because I live, you live also. Thank you, Jesus. For it's in his name that we do humbly pray. Amen. Before we take up our mission offering tonight, as I told you this morning, we're in the month of our Annie Armstrong Easter offering for our home missionaries. This is a big deal. Having people, because we live in a world, no matter where you go, that is so evil that people really, you're talking about people have always needed to hear about Jesus, but in the day and time you and I live in today, oh, do they need to hear about Jesus? Because if they don't hear about him, one day they go hear from him. And that's what they don't even realize or understand that. He will not always be silent. And so it's our job and other folks' job to see that we can do all that we can to get the message of Jesus out to a world that don't care much about him anymore. Well, preacher, why do you say that? Because of what I told you this morning. Several years ago, three out of five people in South Carolina didn't go to church. Now what? Four out of five. Only four, I mean, four out of five do not go to church. Four out of five. You just think about that. And you see the church doors closing. And you see all the other stuff that's happening in the world. Oh, oh, oh. Just hold on. But in this, you know, the most important thing about here or there or the other churches is that the purpose of the church is to change people's lives. The purpose of the church, the preaching, and, and what I talked about this morning, the witnessing, is not for our glory, but it's to see people come to Jesus. Now, we realize in the world that we live in today, we can't reach everybody. You know as well as I do that most will not be reached. But I was reading this thing about people's last words. What is the last thing that they'll say when they leave this world? There's some famous people that had some famous last words. Benjamin Franklin said this. His last words as he was dying was, A dying man can do nothing easy. It's hard. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle that wrote Sherlock Holmes his last words as he looked to his wife 
sitting behind the chair when he died, he looked at her and said, you're wonderful. And he went on to be with the Lord. Winston Churchill, the last words that he whispered as he was dying, his words were, I'm bored with it all. I'm bored looking at the world. He said, I'm bored with it all. Y'all will never read about what my last words are because nobody cares. But the last words of Jesus over in the book of Mark, his last words were, Go ye into all the world. When he talked to his disciples, telling them about Jesus, baptizing them, that is the job that he left for the church, we still live by those last words. And this is a means to help the Word of God get across this country and Canada. It's just a goal of $3,500, and, and it will help pay for missionaries, their ways to, to help do everything they need to help them do to carry the gospel where we can't go. So I just, I just wanted to share that with you. That when I read this thing about... Uh, I thought about it, and th you know, this is what I said. Sharing the word of Jesus should never be a burden to you. Sharing the word of Jesus is a privilege that God has given us to do, and we need to remember that. So just as, we, you know, the envelopes will be there, and, then, and we're going to, every night we take up a, uh, Sunday night, we take, ask you to, to give a dollar when you come to, uh, with the price of inflation. We may have to start raising it up to two dollars because everything's getting so expensive now. So if something don't happen soon, we're probably going to have to give you, raise it up and ask you to give two dollars instead of a dollar. Okay? All right. <laughs> That's right. Whatever it takes. Let's pray. And then Mimi will come and lead us in our, our, our worship song tonight soon and very soon. Father, there are people out there that can do what we can't do. But God, they need our support. Lord, I pray as we go into this is a big month. Easter, Calvary, Resurrection. God, there's so many people in a world that don't know Jesus and don't even care about him anymore. But God, you loved them all. God, you died for them all. And you said it's our responsibility to do everything we can to get that word to them. God, I pray for missionaries all over the world. Lord, I pray that you would be with them, take care of them. Bless their families. Many of them have small children. Other things. Out there trying to do what you call them to do. God, will you take care of them? And God, will you give them souls for their labor? Lord, bless them wherever they are tonight. For it's in Christ's name that we do humbly pray. Amen. Stand with us, please, as we sing soon and very soon. Our ushers will come take your dollar up tonight.
church, perfect song. Well, tonight, I walk. The walk uh, is going to come, and uh, I don't want to pick at him too much. I give him a hard enough time as it is. You just come and bless us, buddy. Okay.
Thank you all. And that's one of the greatest blessings or the greatest blessing that you ever have is to be redeemed. Tonight, I want to share with you as we move into a new phase of prophecy, and I'm going to be honest with you, and it's hard for me to say this, but in a place I've never been before. I've been waiting, pouring my heart out to you this morning about what I was struggling with. This is a preacher who needs to practice what he preaches here. What I tell you about don't backing up and staying in there, that God ain't through. Hey, today. Show you how God works. I'm, I'm happy. I'm good. I heard from God today. I bought this book at a yard sale. Not too many years after I came to Sumter, and I've been here for 24 years. I have an office at the house with books like I do in the office here. I never read it. I bought it like many of the books I got. I got many of them I ain't never read. I just throw it on in one of the shelves with the rest of them. But I was struggling. I study every Saturday morning for a couple hours, every Saturday morning. And I just couldn't get peace. So I just started pulling books out. And I pulled this one out. The title of it is this. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall. It be when the Son of Man comes again. Warning from Bible prophecy about the coming global storm by Jeff Stanley. He's the gentleman that wrote this book. Never met him, don't know it. But what piqued my attention, because I preached to you, have been about prophecy for many years now. As I open that book up and begin to read through it, why, I don't know. This is a God thing here. He put something in my mind that I'd never thought of before. All my life, I've said, as it was in the days of Noah. As it was in the days of Noah. So shall it be when the Son of Man comes again. And I left that like most people do. But I pulled this book out. I just read his introduction. I ain't read a whole lot of it yet. But God put this thought in my mind, and this is where this is going to come from from here on after tonight. How did the world that you and I live in get in such a mess that it's in today? When did it start? How long did it take us to get in the mess we in today? Did it start three years ago? Did it start 10 years ago, 30 years ago, 50 years? When did it start? Then I looked at what he said about Noah. How long did the world of that day have to sin and mess up. How long did God give them before he finally said, enough is enough? Well, I will tell you more about that as we go along. But I do know this. It was longer than 120 years. Because I know for a fact, because the Bible says that Noah preached for 120 years. And with all of his preaching and all of his, and all of his warnings, what happened to the world that he lived in? It just steadily got worse, didn't it? 120 years. Folks, I can't even imagine that number. To preach and preach and preach. 120 years and not one person. Not one, listen to it, not one 
heeded his warning. They lived a life of living and partying and carrying on. You can almost take the world of then and sit it in the world now. It's just different people doing the same things. So that's where God said, read about it. Study about it. So when, when did this happen? That God had to end it. When did it start? How many years did it go before God said enough is enough? How long? You're dead right. 1,600 years after he made Adam and Eve and the old devil got in the Garden of Eden. Finally, 1,600 years later, approximately, God said enough is enough. I've warned you, I've told you, I've blessed you, and you want nothing to do with me. So it's over. And it was over. So now we move on and think on the subject of how long have we been headed for this road as America and the world that we live in that we are going down now. How long has this... Who started what started? This guy that now is it's, it's, it's just it's just rolling faster and faster and faster now. That's the world we live in today. Communications have made that happen. Facebook, your computers have caused this to roll on and on. In the last days, people will have the greatest knowledge in the world, but it will only take them further away from God. That's what the Bible says. We have smart people in this world, and I'm not one of them. I'm a, hey, hey, I'm one of the dullest ones in the drawer, I can tell you that now. But I'm okay with being dull. If I got to be like that to be smart. Now, but that's where we are, Tommy. That's exactly what. So how did we get here? And let me start preaching. How many of you have ever heard of David Jeremiah? I probably got most every book David Jeremiah ever wrote, either in my office in here or my office at the house. Several years ago, David Jeremiah wrote a book. And he entitled that book, Where Do We Go From Here? As he looks at our world, If all the things that preachers preach and I've told you are true, how did we get here? Where are we going to from here? What's coming? In one of his chapters in his book, I want to read you. This is the introduction to the first chapter in his book. I want to read you what he said. He said, a deadly virus is quietly spreading throughout our nation. It is far more lethal than COVID-19. And most Americans are totally unaware of the threat that it poses to our freedoms and our way of life. Folks, I'm going to just add to what he said. What he's saying is, it's sad that what we see in the world that you and I live in today has come to be normal in the world we live in today. That's the sad thing. And that's what he's saying. He says this. This disease is called socialism. Have I not mentioned that to you? David Jeremiah says the disease in this country that's worse than COVID-19 is socialism. And until recently, it has been considered public enemy number one by Americans, but that is no longer the case. A 2020 poll showed that 40% of Americans had a favorable view of socialism. Now that number is 61% when you go between the ages of 18 and 24. Over 60% think we ought to be a socialist country. Who is that? That's the young people. That's that Generation Z that you hear them talk about. It's that younger generation that's coming up, doesn't care anything about God, doesn't care anything about church. Four out of 
uh, five of them won't go to church. That's who he's talking about here. He said, from the erosion of free speech and free exercise of religion to the looming threat of a one-world government that allows no opposition to it. Does that sound familiar? Will they not send the FBI to get you? An American citizen? Because you don't agree with them? They lie to come get me tonight. From the erosion of free speech, exercise of religion, to the threat of a one-world government that allows no opposition. Socialism is a pernicious or evil force. That, follow, that the followers of Christ, listen to this, he says, must be ready to face head on because our very freedom depends on it. Our very freedom depends on it. See, most people don't have a clue, especially younger folks. Those of you and I that have been around this, this old world for a long time, We've heard about it, haven't we? We know about it. We know it's dangerous. We know it's terrible. When you look at the... Well, let me just say this. It's just like every other sin that has been in the world. When we come to this generation where you and I live, what we used to call sin, people no longer call it that anymore. They got another name for it. You see, when it started 60, 70 years ago or longer, it was called communism. That's what it was. Then as we begin to get smarter and think we know more than anybody else does, the devil tells them this. Let me tell you how to get them people to buy in on what you're selling. Change the name of it. Change the name of it. Let's call it socialism. Let's call it people that don't want to really get down and dirty with it. Well, I'm not a socialist. I'm not a communist. I'm a progressive. Same thing. You wash a hog, you still will be a hog. You change his name, he's still going to be a hog. But that's what the devil tells them to do. Make it sound nicer. We're raising up a generation of people that want nice. They want that. They don't want to listen to truth. So you don't tell them it's communism anymore. It's progressivism. In David Jeremiah's book, he nails it. He talks about One of the worst communist countries. Now, we know Russia, China, North Korea, they're in there. But when this began to advance really big like it is now into the country where you and I live, it began in a place called Venezuela. We hear that on the news. We, we talk about that on the news. This began with a man named Hugo Chavez that became, after a war-torn, torn-up world that was there. He sided, and the people, the economy fell in Venezuela. Because in the 1980s and the 1990s, the oil, they lived off of oil. And it crashed. So the people were hungry. They needed money. They needed food. And so what they did, they elected him, Chavez. And he is the one that installed the communist playbook in the government of Venezuela. Where did that come from? Russia. Marxism. That's another good name they like. They like the name Marxism. That don't sound bad. There's a book in the Bible called Mark. So how bad can Marxism be? 
It's totally opposite of that. So when he takes over in Venezuela, this is what he does. See, this is what they're warning us of, of an America of happening to Christianity and the religion that we live in. When he took office, the first thing he did was rewrite the Constitution of Venezuela to say what he and his government wanted it to say. That's the first thing he did. Second thing he did was this. He said, this, now this is going to sound for me, but this is exactly what he did. David Jeremiah said, his first task was to write the Constitution, guarantee citizens the free rights of government. That government would provide health care for all people. That government would pay for all college educations. Y'all ever hear any of that? I don't need it anymore. Huh? That government would pay for all their education. And that we would make social justice. Are all people equal? No matter what. That's what socialism does. That's not what communism does. That's what he did to Venezuela. The people got so dependent on the government feeding them, clothing them, educating them, doing all this stuff, that when he ran for re-election in 2006, guess what happened? Went by a landslide. You know why? Because you don't vote for him, he'll kill you. That's communism. That's socialism. That's what's sweeping in to America today. So he got reelected. What did he do to, then? He took control of the court system. You tell me how much you like the court system in America today. How many of you want to go to court? <laughs> He took control of the courts. He took control of, both, of all the bodies of the legislature. And then he did what? He nationalized the media. The media could not say anything against him. And he removed the voices of dissent. Now, I just, in a new cycle that we're going through, we just saw in Russia, how this one guy that had spoken out against Russia, they had had him in jail, had him in jail, and they poisoned him to death, and they killed him because he spoke out against them. That's socialism. That's communism. That's what's rolling this way into this country. And just like the days of Noah, it took a lot of years to get here. It just didn't happen overnight for Noah to do that. But folks, we need to be very careful of this stuff. Then the next thing he did, he took over the banks. He took over the power companies. He took over the farms. Everything belonged to the government. That's socialism. You don't want anything. They take your house. They take your land. And you just think how serious, remember what I told you in the beginning. Jeremiah said that 61% of people between the ages of 18 and 25 believe that's the way to go. You just think about that. Six out of ten of that age think that's a good thing. These are the young folks that's going to be running this country. Think if it lasts that long. Now, this is just me. I've, I've read several books about this. When this border crisis started, where did most of them people come from? Venezuela. Venezuela. You tell me how good it is when people will walk miles upon miles taking their children and babies. Now, I'm not, on, I'm not going to, but I just tell you how bad that a country can get. And folks, understand something. 
All this happened in the last 25 years. Now, Noah had preached for 120, and I, you know, and it had got really bad. So the question is, Lord, I got to quit. So the question I ask us as we begin in this study of Noah and the days of Noah and what those days were like and how they compare to the days that you and I live in, why should we care about that? We better understand, and I like, David Jeremiah said in one of his books I was reading that the greatest threat and the greatest danger to the United States of America is socialism. That's the greatest threat. Not COVID. Not all this murder. Not all this junk you see. He says our greatest threat is that. Well, why should I care, preacher? My life ain't changed that much. Hey, it ain't over with yet. It ain't over with yet now. You should care. Because America is being invaded. And they have different ideologies than I have or you have. And they plan to come and they put there. And one thing I've learned that I never thought of is growing up as a boy. That America is one of the most easily deceived people that I've ever seen. Americans will buy in on anything if it's a new voice. That's America today, folks. Am I wrong or right? If y'all think I'm wrong, boot. I'm telling you, this is the deal. And it's spilling in, and I'll close with this statistic. In 2020, a poll showed that, that 40% of Americans viewed socialism as a favorable, favorable thing. That was up from 36% in 2019. Even more frightening, 47% of millennials, that's the next age group, above them the 30, 35, 40, 47% of millennials and 49% of Generation Z. Already told, that's, you take anybody under 50 years of age, let's just all lump them together. If they under 50 years of age or thereabout, 47% believe that socialism is the way to go. 40, half of our 50 and younger generation believe. Axios did a poll, and it said that 61% of Americans between the ages of 18 and 24 have a positive reaction to socialism. So let's don't take it too lightly. Have you noticed? This, this is just a thought. And I'm not trying to be a newsman, but I'm going to tie all this together with Satan in the coming weeks. Have you noticed in the last four, five, six years how many socialist people have been elected to government in this country? And I ain't talking about just socialists. I'm talking about radicals that make the laws for this country. Every year, there seems to be more and more and the sad thing is this. I may never get to preach to you again. But I'm going to tell you something. When a person is a devout communist and tell you that they want to run for the president of the United States of America and they can get 20 to 30% of the vote, I'm going to tell you, that's scary. Bernie Sanders. When you have one of the most powerful young people in this land 
that says she is an avowed member of the Democratic Socialist Party of America, which is the low, largest socialist organization in the United States. And she sits in Congress. They make the laws. That's what they do. But in the last days, and this is where I'll start with Noah after I got through all this. If they still let me, if, if they ain't send the law after me, and I'll be able to be back next Sunday. The Bible warns us of this. The problem is, we're no different than Noah's people. He warned them for. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, and they just kept going to God, couldn't do it anymore. That's what's going to happen to the world. That's what's going to happen to this country. But as the days of Noah were also the coming of the Son of Me, for in that day, uh, before the flood, they were eating, drinking, marrying, parting, giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not until the flood came, and he took them all away. So also will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. I did get your Bible verse in there tonight. I did do that. So, next Sunday night, let's delve into that a little deeper. I ain't been there. This will be a first for me, and I'm looking forward to it. 1,600 years. Why did it take so long? What were the people doing that in the days of Noah that they just ignored everything that was godly? And this is what happened. They did not understand what was going on until it was too late. That's where most people will be when God comes a second time. They would have rejected the message. That's why these missionaries are so important. You make no bones about it now. The devil's slick. The devil knows how to get evil done. He knows who will listen to him. Robbie, we was going out this morning, <laughs> talking about how close the end of time might be. And you've heard me say plenty of times that I believe it's closer than most of us ever dream it is. I really believe that. Things have happened too fast and not for the good. Well, not for the good if you don't know Jesus, but if you like us, know Jesus, that's the best thing ever happened to you. You hear that shout from heaven. Hey, hey, I'm good. How you go? Let's go. Let's go. Amen. I'm with you. I ain't worried about that. Because I don't like the world I live in today. It's a sad place. But I got the joy of the Lord. Because I'm his child. Because of that scripture I preached to you this morning. He was with me in the past. He's with me in the present. And he's going to be with me when he takes me to glory one day. It's okay. Most people never make it, though. Most people be just like the people in Noah's day. They will have missed the message, and they'll miss heaven. Thank you for being here. I'll pick it up next Sunday night on the days of Noah. Can we see anything in the days of Noah that might give us a hint of the day you and I live in? Thank you for being with us tonight. Mr. and Ms. Christmas, glad to have you all with us tonight. Glad for them.